Okay, and ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, we are going to be hearing from Connor Ahern um, on the latest in his QS series, Loss and Expense Claims. Uh, Connor is uh, a trainee associate with us, but he also has many years of QS experience. Um, so he's able to speak to you from both the legal and the QS angle on uh, loss and expense. So without any more ado, I will hand over to Connor. Good evening, Mr. Ahern, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, you're all very welcome to yeah, the latest in the, in the quantity surveying series. So this evening, we're going to be discussing the exciting topic of loss and expense. OK, so you know, the, there's a picture of me. Yeah, I'm a previously a quantity surveyor and currently training to become a solicitor. I'm looking to finish the training contract in September. Um, some of my details are there. A lot of people tend to ask questions about, you know, why convert or how can how to convert. So, look, if if you're interested in hearing any more about that, just please uh, feel free to get in touch. Okay. Right. We we'll move on. <clears throat> yeah. So, look, we're all here talking about uh, loss and expense, but you know, I think it's uh, appropriate to introduce with uh, with coronavirus and the and the effect that that has had on on the country, plus also on, on the construction industry, um, especially. You know, we've had many queries from clients and, uh, and the, you know, the wider public, even in relation to, you know, how, how does it affect the ongoing operation of, of construction? And, you know, we're talking about the areas of force majeure and frustration, and is there loss and expense applicable to coronavirus, et cetera? which I might touch on later as well. So look, I hope you're all well and safe at this time. It's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, the uh, Zoom seems to be, I think we'll be conducting a, a large part of our lives through Zoom once this is over. So, so yeah, it's, it's a good, good um, look, it's a good area to be, you know, to focus on. And uh, yeah, as I said, I hope you're all well at this time. <clears throat> okay, so, Moving on, we're going to, yeah, as I said, discuss loss and expense. Now, this seminar is split into three parts. So the part one, we're going to uh, discuss, you know, what is loss and expense and when does it arise under the contract? Uh, and once we get, once we get uh, through that, we're going to move on to discuss liability and especially the uh, uh, causation. That's a very important point in when putting forward a loss and expense application. Then we we'll go on to quantum and how we present our numbers in order to recover uh, recover our, our last and expense sums. And then we'll conclude uh, before having a questions and answers session. Now, if you want, if you do have any questions throughout the seminar, just please uh, put them in the chat box and uh, Julie will bring them to my attention and we can try and deal with them at the end. Um, we, this is actually the second seminar. Uh, I previously did it at five o'clock. So, there was quite a few questions there, um, and look, there was probably too many to deal with. So we'll probably do. Um, uh, I'll write up the write up the questions and put some answers in, and circulate those as well um, in the next few days. Okay, <clears throat> right. We'll go on to part one. Okay, so part one: what is loss and expense? Okay, loss and expense is is actually not a defined term. It's not defined in any one of our standard form contracts. Um, and also, you know, loss and expense, when we say loss and expense, we are thinking about uh, damages, compensation events as well. These are all terms that are generally, in, they're, they come under the same bracket and they generally mean the same thing. Now, where the original, you know, I suppose, definition of damages or loss and expense came from was actually the case of Robinson versus Harmon back in 1848. And in that case, it, it was uh, the, it was the it was said that the general principle of contractual damages is to put the claimant in the position that they would have enjoyed if the contract had been performed. Consequently, the claimant should not be put in a better position than they would have enjoyed had the contract been performed as well. Now, that's a very important that's a very good principle, and it's it's a term that we that we know as the golden rule. And it's it's very it's it's um, very appropriate to remember that when you are putting applications forward in order to recover sums under loss and expense. 
So just just remember that put the put the claimant in the position they would have enjoyed if the contract had been performed. And that you know that uh, Ray versus P H and T in in 1968 considered a question. And again, just it was dealt with, and it was it was um, it was thought to mean the equivalent. It, loss and expense was to mean the equivalent to damages at common law. Again, it's all it's all consistent. Okay, so how does loss and expense arise? So we're going to look at um, loss and expense under contract, but also under common law, which which happens. We're, so firstly, under contract, um, the entitlement arises, but only when the only when payment is not reimbursed elsewhere in the contract. So classic, like typically under JCT, which is you know the uh, I guess the most popular form of contract. Um, loss and expense will be dealt with following reimbursement of items such as the contract sum, provisional sums, uh, variations, and day works. I like to think of loss and expense as the residue of what's left in order to recover your full entitlements, financial entitlements under the contract. And so, but also loss and expense can arise under common law because under common law we have, you know, terms such as a duty not to hinder or the duty to cooperate, which if say a client breaches those can result in entitlement under common law. Now this is an area, this is, uh, so where there is entitlement under the terms of the contract, uh, one's common law rights are retained unless expressly excluded. And that frequently happens under schedules of amendments. Uh, so that's, a, that's highlighting the fact that you can lose your right to recover under common law if the schedule of amendments is, you know, says so. So it's an area that you ought to look out for when you're vetting your contracts because it, it, does, it does happen. So that's just a warning there. Okay, moving on. So again, loss and expense under the contract. So it arises uh, where, the, where uh, matters affect the regular progress of the works. And that is it, typically through uh, deferred possession uh, which happens where you know you promise to start date, uh, or as we frequently see now, where you're offered like the start window, and that window is quite generous, usually around six to twelve weeks. So generally, the deferred possession ground comes up is coming up less and less. And the second ground is where the regular progress of the works has been affected. Now that is a typical ground where you will seek to recover your loss and expense, and. That is where we're going to be focusing on moving forward. Okay, so what do you need to do? When you think that the regular progress of the works has been affected, you know, the, the first thing you do, obviously, is, you, you know, you're required to act as soon as you become aware or also as soon as you ought to have become aware. You know, it's not enough to say that you weren't, um, you know, made aware at the time or that, you know, it wasn't brought to your attention. That's not good enough. It's, it's whenever, you know, when you ought to become aware is equally appropriate. And so when you become aware, you know, the advice is that you ought to submit a notice. Now, in that notice, you want to be providing evidence that is reasonably necessary to show that the regular progress has been affected. And what you want to do is to be able to attach it to one of the relevant matters uh, the grounds of which are specified around, you know, typically, again, lost the JCT. Uh, your loss and expense clauses are typically around clause 4.20, and that will usually set out what you need to do. So in the notice, you need to show that the um, regular progress has been affected. Uh, provide as much information as possible as you, as you can, you know, with correct references back to the contract price, contract program, and, and the contract itself. I mean, if you need to cite the clauses that you're relying on, then you, are, then you absolutely should do that. Um, if you can, with the notice, submit a breakdown of sums, it's difficult. And, a, and a, a generally, I would say, to get the notice in and follow up with the sums, because the notice will, get the, will, will set the ball rolling in the process. And you can always update, you know, you can provide the breakdown then in due course. Don't risk you know, delaying the notice just because you're trying to get the quantum um, 100%. It's very, it's notoriously difficult to get your application for loss and expense um, absolutely 100% correct at first, at first outset anyway. Um, so you, and then you want to get a response. So get a response to your loss and expense assessment 
I usually say about eight, eight to 12 weeks. I mean, try and get it sooner, but that's generally a, a, you know, a reasonable time for parties to consider the, the notice and the, and the application and then to provide a, a thorough response. So moving on to the relevant matter, what are the relevant matters in the JCT? Um, I mean, there's four, there's four listed, and the main ones are yeah, the, the first, uh, which is variations. So you may have lost an expense associated with variations that have been instructed by your clients. Now, when you're pricing the variation, I would recommend that you include the consequential effect, which is your loss and expense aspect of the variation with the variation pricing. It's, it's all, if you can do that, then absolutely go ahead because you're going to have, it's, it's, it's better than coming along and uh, six months later and saying, well, you remember the variation, say where, you know, we put in more, more dense rebar in, in a slab, for example, um, then coming along afterwards and saying, oh, well, as a result of that, you know, we had heavier formwork or, you know, we had to carry out further propping to the slabs, you, you know, stuff like that. You need to understand the consequential effect at the time of the variation. So if you can do that, then absolutely submit the lots and expense with the variation pricing. Um, then you also have the other grounds such as architect's instructions, the uh, execution where, you know, uh, where approximate quantity is not reasonably accurate. Um, you know, we, we, we see approximate quantities is, is, is used less and less, so generally ten, tends to be a clause that is used very rarely. Um, the final clause is what we call the catch-all clause. Um, the catch-all clause refers to any impediment, prevention or default, whether by act or omission by the contractor's persons. Now, this is the classic clause for loss and expense because what you are seeking to do is to recover the inefficient sums associated with, a, with the impediment prevention or default of your client. Um, and that's where you'd be looking for your general disruption. And you generally, most loss and expense clauses, in my experience, uh, fall, under, fall under that heading. So, th so, you know, there you have it. I mean, you know, understand what, the, understand what loss and expense is, understand uh, what the contract says. You get those things right at the outset, then you're setting yourself up for success for your loss and expense application. Okay, we're going to move on to part two. Part two uh, deals with liability. So, you know, again, a very uh, moving on from the contracts, you want to be able to establish the liability points. So in order to be entitled to loss and expense, there must have been a breach or a change to the original contract intent. This requires a clear understanding of what we are contractually required to do, um, which involves understanding the price and program uh, required and, and those documents that have been incorporated into the contract. Because if you don't know what, the, that's a very strong principle to have. If you, if you understand the basis of the price and program, then you will easily spot um, uh, variations and loss and expense that happens throughout the works. It's very difficult to, it, it's very difficult to assess loss and expense if you don't have a strong understanding of your price and program and generally leads to delayed notices, um, which if you have condition precedence in your contract, you may run out of time in, under which, in which to submit your notice. If that happens, then you're going to be in a difficult position where you, 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 you may not have any contractual ground for loss and expense. So do bear that in mind. That sounds simple, but um, that, is, that is a real, uh, really, important point to be able to assess loss and expense uh, obviously uh, to be able to assess your contract price as a whole which we ought to be able to do and then also and the other point to emphasize is that the other party must be responsible that is a that is a key point as well because if you're going to so if the regular progress of the works has been affected they can, that can be affected also as a result of your own inefficiencies or your own culpable delays. If that happens, then the other party will not be responsible for that, and you will fail on liability, and you won't be able to proceed with your loss and expense application. So it's very important that you get the liability point established up front. 
And um, moving on, so liability, when we say liability, we are also referring to causation. Now the leading case on causation is Hadley versus Baxendale, and which comes, which was back in 1854. So still 170 years ago later, still remains good law. So um, in Hadley versus Baxendale, they established two limbs to, uh, uh, for damages. Um, so damages available from breach of contract include those that may fairly and reasonably be considered arising naturally from the breach of contract. And the second limb of Hadley versus Baxendale confirms that such damages as may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of the parties at the time the contract was made. Now, so if a loss could not be foreseen on formation of the contract, then the general rule is that it cannot be claimed. So if you are seeking to recover a loss and expense for something that the, your client could simply never have foreseen, some lucrative contract that you never brought to their attention, which actually was the case in Hadley versus Baxendale, then they will not be required to provide compensation for such. So that's the, that comes back to the test of remoteness. And again, there, there are two limbs that have to be satisfied when making the application for, for loss and expense. Um, this area is also not like when we say causation, think cause and effect. Be clear on what the cause is, because th that is your liability point. The effect will be quantum, which we will come on to consider later. And this is an area that, say, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, working on for contractors, is to test the contract references and the liability points. Because if you can do that, then again, as I said, get, that, get those points right early then you're setting, you're setting uh, your clients up to succeed on the quantum points, be, you know, because that's an area that they'll be very strong at putting forward. And typically where you can get them moving in the right direction with the contract and liability, they will be very successful, which is exactly what we want from our, from our applications here. Now, where we cannot show the cause and effect for each relevant matter for which, to, for which our client is responsible, we end up in the realm of uh, what's known as global claims. So in some circumstances, a contractor may find it difficult to, to show that a particular breach by his employer caused a particular loss to the contractor. In such a situation, a contractor may try to claim its loss and expense in a single rolled up claim. And this is what's known as a global claim. Global or total cost claims are terms used to describe a contractor's claim that identifies a number of causes of delay and or disruption and can seek to link them to the contractor's total. From this figure, the employer's net payment is deducted and the claim for the balance is made without attributing actual costs to individual events. So that's what a classic global claim is. It, and, 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 and it happens where you know, a contractor is coming to the end of the job and he, he's not sure what, you know, what, what his profit margin is going to be at the end. He may be staring down the barrel of a loss on the contract as well. And he is not going to take that lying down. So typically the, the industry has dealt with that by submitting global claims, usually in the form of delay and disruption claims. Now, that is, a, like, that is still common in, in practice. I mean, as a solicitor, you know, that is something that we are keen to avoid when we're looking to protect our client. Because what you'd want is to have um, a condition precedent to loss and expense. You would want to be state. You would want to put the onus on the contractor to give notice for loss and expense. You know, with, within seven or fourteen or twenty-eight days, whatever the case may be, whatever whatever is reasonable, as much as possible. And um, you know, so you don't have that classic delay and disruption claim coming in at the end of a contract, which is, can be notoriously diff difficult to deal with. So you, as, a, as an employer, that is something that you absolutely do not want. Um, and uh, my recommendation is that global claims should be avoided. And, uh, and I'll show you why. Uh, Walter Lilly versus Mackay uh, was a classic case, uh, which, which, yeah, on a proper, like, on a proper analysis, um, the global or total cost claim, which the parties actually assumed it was. But when you looked at the facts of that case, it was actually, 
um, a properly substantiated loss and expense application rather than a global cost claim. And, and, and as a result, Walter Lilly were very successful in, the, in that application and in the recovery of sums from, from Mr. McCoy. Um, Aiken had in that judgment uh, said he gave his reasons as to why it wasn't a global claim when he said that Walter Lilly's pleadings did identify a comprehensible case in relation to delay. So that, that's, when he says that, that means they satisfy uh, causation. Uh, Walter Lilly's case for extended preliminaries and profit and overhead was related solely to the periods of delay for which it asserted that it was entitled to extensions of time. So again, where they, where they had the extended preliminaries, they, that was on, so that would be a prolongation claim. That was obviously linked to a separate application for an extension of time from Walter Lilly, which had been made under clause 2.20 of the, of the contract. And finally, the subcontractor claims are largely based on extension delay and to the sums actually paid, if not yet paid, due to the relevant subcontractor. So again, just feeds into the point that Walter Lilly's claim, it was not in fact a global claim, which, was a, which actually was a common misconception following the case and which for a time actually encouraged people to bring global claims, which was obviously not what the intention of the courts was. Okay. So the claims for claims by contractors for loss and expense must be proved as a matter of fact. Now, what this means is that the contractor has to demonstrate on the balance of probabilities that events occurred which entitled it to loss and expense, that those events caused delay and or disruption, and such delay or disruption caused it to incur loss and or expense. Again, just re-emphasizing the point, the event has to be uh, has to be caused by the other by, by the client in these circumstances. If it hasn't, you will not be successful with the with your application. And here is where uh, global claims. Uh, this is why global claims are so risky. As a final point, is that the inf the entire claim can fail and has failed on several occasions if the loss had if uh, if any part of the loss in that global claim. Has been caused by the applicant and if you think about it where like a classic global claim will basically be a contractor's entire cost for that job lest uh, lest he's cost that he's been paid under the contract and he's obviously looking to recover the difference but who's to say that the, that the, the difference any part of that hasn't been caused by the own inefficiencies of the contractor if it has the the tendency is that the global claim must fail so that's the word of warning. And go, go back to your liability, establish your cause and effect, and that way you do not run the risk of playing a very high stakes game with your, with your global claim in the hope that some part of it will be paid. It's, it's a very risky strategy, and one that I'd be keen to advise clients to avoid as, as much as possible. Okay, so we move on. So we've dealt with what the contract says, we've dealt with liability, and now we're going to move on to quantum. Uh, so quantum, so the typical heads of loss that we consider uh, with our loss and expense application um, is, uh, is preliminaries, uh, general disruption, head office overheads and profit, finance charges, and the cost of collating the claim. So preliminaries, so Preliminaries, the two classic headings for loss and expense of preliminaries. Uh, the first one is prolongation. So that's, that happens when the contract, you know, the overall completion date is extended um, as a result of relevant matters or, or even the relevant events for which you are seeking an extension of time. If you're entitled to the extension of time, then you will, you will automatically look to see whether you're entitled to the loss and expense. Um, and if you are entitled to the, to the loss and expense, then you will go for your, your, your prolonged preliminaries as a result. Um, so when you, when you go for the, pro, uh, the prolongation the pre, uh, on your preliminaries, uh, just bear in mind that you are entitled to recover your actual cost associated. Um, and that principle applies whether your rates in, the, in your contract sum are, are 
in, in, in excess of what your actual cost for, do, for, that, for those preliminaries are. And similarly, it works the other way where, you know, the, the cost would be, sorry, the value you might have in your preliminaries is not sufficient to meet, um, to meet the cost, the actual cost of the preliminaries on that project. Again, go back to the golden rule. Um, you should be put back in the position you would have been if the contract had been, you know, if there had been no breach of the contract. And by virtue of the fact that you're entitled to an extension of time, well, then it ought to be the case that you are entitled to, that there has been a breach and you are entitled to be put back in the position you would have been in if it had been properly performed. So just bear that in mind. Um, the second ground there is the preliminary th uh, thickening. So that occurs where you have more supervision on a, pro on a contract, as an, as, but it must be as a result of the changes. Um, preliminary thickening, you know, you might have to work in, in more areas than envisaged. You might need more supervision, you know, as a result of, you know, as it says there, as a result of those changes. Again, you, but the only way that you will get the thickening is if you can show your cause and effect. If you can overcome the liability uh, point and show that the cause has been a breach caused by the client and therefore the effect is that you have required more preliminaries on the project. So they're the two classic heads to consider when putting forward your application for preliminaries. Right, and the next one is the general disruption. Now when we talk about the general disruption, what we're, what we're seeking to do is to uh, show our as planned uh, versus our as built. So as planned being what you intended to carry out at the time of contract. Now, when doing that, uh, we're going to, you know, I'm going to re-emphasize the point uh, about records. Basically, you know, records are key. Um, as I'm, I mean, as I'm sure you're all, you're all aware, they're key to uh, it to everything when you're when it comes to loss and expense and proving our disruption. And when I say records, you know, you want to, um, you want to be considering, you know, obviously daily diaries. Um, and it's, it's also important to check the, the detail provided in the daily diaries um, on, a, on a consistent basis. You know, you, you don't want to end up in a case where you have a load of daily diaries, but they don't give you the information that's, um, that's going to support your application. Um, also, you, you may consider the allocation sheets. Uh, they were, you know, they're a classic, uh, a good record to show exactly what was going on when. Um, obviously photographs and then also, uh, you know, progress reports can help as well. Because what you're trying to do is you're, uh, when you experience disruption, you are trying to show the impact of that disruption. And in order to do that, you want to be able to show your outputs at a time when you were not affected by any of the relevant matters. If, so if you have your outputs during that the time you were not affected, you can then compare that to your outputs following the regular progress of the works being effect, having been affected. And, ba and basically what you're looking to pick up is the difference between your what we call as planned versus your as built. And the difference is, is what is classic, is classic loss and expense. So when you come to that, um, the non-productive, so what you're looking to recover is a non-productive line time, sorry, um, typically associated with your labor and plant. So you want to show your labor on a formulaic basis to show that, you know, it was achieving X during the non-affected period. And now it's, now it's achieving Y uh, during the affected period. And you're, and you're looking to claim the difference. Absolutely classic area for, for loss and expense. Um, the same goes for your, for your plant, because your plant is on site anyway. The problem being is that it's not as efficient or it's not as effective as it would have been had there not been a, had there not been a breach uh, for which you're entitled to loss and expense. So again, make sure that the plant is in there um, and that there is you know, a good record to substantiate these points. This is the, this is the real battleground um, for you know how successful how successful your application is going to be, um, and and the better the records, the better the evidence, uh, the better the better the outcome. Um, so moving on, um, head office overheads and profit. 
Yeah, this was a head that again was discussed at length in Walter Lilly versus Mackay. The the courts are receptive to you know to the recovery of overheads and profit uh, on a formulaic basis. The, the most popular being uh, the Emden's formula, the Hudson formula, also the HV formula, which is coming from the US. Uh, you know they're all recognised areas. Um, uh, formulas to calculate that loss. So, you know, but one of the areas that does tend to cause an issue is the area on profit. Because um, you, in order to show that you're entitled to the profit, um, you need to show that your price or, or that you are going to make a profit on the works, uh, on, on your contract works anyway. Um, now that's, fit, that's not as simple as just saying, well, you know, I priced 10% overheads and I priced 10% profit, so my loss is 10% profit. It can go like it can be a real battleground again uh, to show that that was actually what you were going to uh, to realize. Again, remember the golden rule: put you in the position that you would have been in if the contract had been properly performed. That becomes a difficult point in relation to profit, and one that you know bears out on the facts and and whatever can be proved by the by the parties. When making the submission. Okay, finance charges. So the case of Minter confirmed that uh, you know finance charges are recoverable as a head of uh, loss and expense. The the principle being that is that they arise as a result of the claimants being kept from their money. Um, also, finance charges they satisfy the remoteness test that we discussed in Hadley versus Baxendale. So again, you know, having your interest calculations in in your loss and expense application is absolutely the right uh, the right way to proceed. Okay, finally, the the final head is the cost of collating your claim. Um, so it, it, usually uh, some of your costs associated will be recovered through your preliminaries, and that's classically quantity surveyors time. Uh, as, as a result, you know, in relation to producing the quantum. Also project managers, uh, you know, a lot of project managers are proficient at ASTA or, or similar um, uh, delay analysis software where you're putting forward, uh, you know, applications for extensions of time, etc. And, um, you know, as the other side been unreasonable in their conduct, generally that can lend itself to being successful with creating the claim, but, you know, Advice has been, and from experience, I've usually recovered a lot of it through the through, through the preliminary exam and assessment. Okay, so now what? So now that I've submitted my quantum, what do I need to to do and to prove it? Um, so you know, again, classic JCT talk is that you know what, whatever is reasonable um, in the circumstances, but you know, but what does that really mean? It can be it can be quite difficult, especially if. You know, you're getting a, a late loss and expense application. The relationship is already fraught or, or strained as a result of events on site. Um, you know, so this can be this can become a, a difficult point to deal with. Now, in the past, I've, I mean, I've basically gone. You know, provided invoices have been sufficient in some in some um, applications. That's been to show the you know the cost of my of my plant typically. The also you you know sometimes put forward. Pay slips just sometimes examples of that has been sufficient to say, to show that what you're what you're putting forward is genuine. Um, I've also had the case where I've had um, you know clients coming yeah clients come to our offices to investigate uh, cost ledgers because uh, to be fair in the circumstances it was probably that was probably reasonable. Because they were facing such a significant issue with their client that it was completely foreseeable that one day they would end up in front of the courts. And the question about, you know, did they did they test the veracity of the applications that were made to them? And in those circumstances, uh, yeah, they they had to they came to look at our at our ledgers, and you know that was reasonable. And some and this, you know obviously the sums that were put forward were paid and. And that was how we overcame the issue, but but you know it, it can be it can be difficult, and it often depends on on the on the facts and the circumstances. But again, just remember, you know what is reasonable, and um, you know that is 
you always you do have to to hark back to that point. Right. Uh, look, we're nearly we're nearly there. Um, so just to I suppose wrap up. Uh, you know, what do you need to do if you encounter loss and expense? So you know, we say you need to act quickly. You need to check your contract. You need to make sure that you understand one what the contract says, and also you will need to make sure that you satisfy any condition precedents that may be present in your contract. Because again, if you fail to give your notice in time, then you may lose your entitlement to your loss and expense under the contract. So it's very important to, you know, don't don't sit on don't sit on 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 the issue. Deal with it early and, and give your notice as quickly as possible. Um, you then you obviously you need to make sure that it's a relevant matter, that it is one of the grounds which entitle you to recover loss and expense. So obviously you need to check that. Um, and then also you, is the event of variation, is it linked to a variation? That's a very valid question to ask as well. You know, can you price it in a variation rather than treat it as a separate loss and expense application? If you can do that, then I would recommend uh, that, that you go ahead and do it. Um, so yeah, so that's what the contract says, your liability, and you know, the quantum will follow. So look, my recommendation would be when you're dealing with, with it is to, is to follow that three-step process. Um, another tip is that I wouldn't call it a claim. Um, a claim is a, you know, can be quite an, an emotive uh, term. And again, it, do, it doesn't help when dealing with loss and expense. Loss and expense is an application under the contract. It's not a claim. There's no claim wording. Um, especially in JCT and you know in, in NEC we, we call it um, a compensation event. The word claim can be associated with, with FIDIC terminology but you know in the circumstances by and large uh, always you know treat it as an application rather than a claim and I think you'll have a, you, you stand a better chance of, uh, of being successful. Um, remember also you know in, in your contract it will it will include uh, you know your ongoing duty to mitigate loss and you have to you know, you have to, um, try, you know, in the circumstances, take reasonable steps to, you know, mitigate uh, the effect of, you know, the relevant matter. And uh, you also have the duty to mitigate the effect of irrelevant as well, which may entitle you to an extension of time. So always remember the duty to mitigate and, not, and, and to use reasonable endeavours there. But bear in mind that, that, you know, if that is upgraded to a best endeavours obligation, which can happen under the schedule of amendments, then you, under best endeavours, you may be expected to spend some amount of money um, in order to mitigate. So look, please bear that in mind as well. Um, okay, look, that's, uh, look, I'm gonna wrap up now with the conclusion. Again, that look, they, there's been three parts to this. I think it's very helpful if you can follow that process to, you know, for number one, understand uh, what your contract says and uh, number two establish your, your your liability point and and your causation point that's very important so if you have if you have got you know if you're reasonably so if you're solid on those points then the, you know the quantum becomes very straightforward because again remembering Hadley versus Baxendale it's the you know your quantum is going to be the cost that naturally arise as a result of the breach. So, you know, it's, it's going to save you a lot of time to be getting on with other works um, and make sure that what you're putting forward, you know, day one is, is, is reasonably accurate and save, you know, several amendments again at a later date, which, you know, which can be unhelpful and, and serve to only strain the relationship further. So follow the points, understand what the contract says, understand liability, and then the quantum will flow from that. That's been my experience uh, where, you know, it, when, when I was practicing as a QS, you know, if we, we, when, we, when we dealt with the um, liability, dealt with the contract, the causation was successful. It's been the same experience, I have to say, as a, as a trainee solicitor. We frequently advise clients on the liability and contract points, and that has set them up for success. So I'd look, I, I, when putting forward, I think that's the that's the recommended way to go. Uh, so look, that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, we're going to hold a questions and answer session now. Or uh, if you want to email me separately afterwards, then feel free to do so. And uh, my email address is there.
Uh, okay, thanks very much, everyone. Okay, Connor, we've got some questions. Um, they've been coming in thick and fast in the last 10 minutes. Right. Um, the first one, how do you deal with the scenario where multiple variations uh, or the total quantum of variations cause a delay rather than one single event or variation? Um, I think, you know, how you deal with that is that, you know, you're able to identify what each variation is. That's where you can, that, that's what I'm saying about the liability point is that you can actually link each event, you know, establish the cause. And if you can do that, then the effect is that you can uh, calculate, you know, put forward the quantum on the basis of each individual event. But we should always make as much effort as we possibly can to deal with each of the causes separately. Because if you don't, you'll end up in the situation where you have the global claim, which for the reasons uh, that I've explained, it's, it's, it's too risky. And, and, I'd, and I'd always advise to just, you know, be clear on your cause and effect. You will have a better chance of recovering your, the proper sums due as a result. Okay, uh, we've also been asked, what if change makes things easier? What if change makes things easier? Like, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, what if change makes things, I mean, if change makes things easier, then you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be suffering. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be suffering as, as a result. I mean, you go back to the heads that we were saying, you know, if it's easier, then you're not going to require an extension of time. So you, you, won't, you won't require any prolongation costs. Um, you, you know, you won't, uh, you won't require any general disruption to your plants and labor either. I mean, if, it's a, if that's a variation, I mean, arguably, you know, the parties, you know, there could possibly be a saving there as well. You know, so the, and the contract works to, to deal with that. So look, if it gets easier, well and good. I mean, this experience says that unfortunately changes make things more difficult than to do easier. But uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's my advice on that point. Julie? Uh, sorry, you're fading out slightly there, Connor. So just make sure you're close to your mic. Yeah. Um, someone else has asked, can you claim contract OHP and add Hudson formula to an LNE claim? Uh, can you repeat that again, Julie? Can you add con? Sorry, can you claim <coughs> contract OHP and add Hudson formula to an LNE claim? Mm, the, the general, general. The, sorry, the general rule is that you that you cannot do that because you're you're effectively seeking to recover your your overhead and profit twice when you do that. So the advice is, you know, follow the formula. Follow the formula. You know, if you want, to pick one over the other. Whatever, whatever think, whatever you think will give you the higher chance of success. Follow that one. But arguably, if you put in for both, then you're doubling up and you're seeking to recover twice for the same event. Okay. Um, another question: Are there any rulings or guidelines for valuing subcontractor LNE claims, for example, offsite joinery fabrication? I can understand non-productive time on site, but when a joiner claims downtime for machinery and operatives, I find it difficult to value. In my mind, the joiners could be working on fabricating for other contracts, assuming they have other orders, rather than downing tools and not working. Yeah, no, a notoriously difficult area to value because you're, you know, the, you, say your subcontractor is looking for inefficient working back at the workshop, and you're saying. I mean, I, I don't have any control over that. And, you know, that comes down to, you know, what was, was notice given? I mean, were, was it communicated that these resources were, were, were working inefficiently back at, you know, back at the joinery workshop or back, you know, in, in the fabrication workshop, where, you know, wherever? Uh, you know, so the subcontractor should be coming to you to say that, you know, these, re these resources are, um, are working inefficiently. I am suffering loss, yeah, and and how you go about proving that then is, uh, you know, you you may need to visit the. I mean, I, I've seen it before where you've gone and visited the the workshop to verify that these people were there, to in order to understand 
that uh, you know any potential loss and expense applications were genuine. You know, so it's kind of when it bears out in the facts. You 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 have to be you know re, you know reasonable and and deal with it on a, on a, on a case by case basis. But that one I have sympathy with. I mean, gui guidance. Mm, it depends on you know as I said, it depends on the facts. It's a very it's a but it's a, it's a very difficult one. I, I had one recently uh, with a steelwork contractor claiming. Um, you know, as a result of a very as a result of a variation, his you know his uh, his CAD technician wasn't able to work for for a week as a result. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't make sense. You always have to be sensible, even in the applications, but also in in dealing with you know how credible is it that these losses have actually been incurred and that the subcontractor is enti entitled to recover costs as a result. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, we've also been asked, what's the equivalent of the early warning clause under a JCT contract? What's the equivalent? There is yeah. none. There is no equivalent of an early warning. The, the requirement in JCT is that you give notice um, if you have been or are likely to be, um, or the regular progress of the works is likely to be affected. I mean, there, so there's no contractual obligation. I mean, no, good practice says that you give notice as soon as you, you as soon as you become aware that it may it, you know it may be uh, an issue in the future. Definitely do that, but there's no requirement for early notice under JCT. Okay, um, why is the loss and expense not called a claim? Um, no, it, it can be called a claim, uh, but. The problem in in my experience when you call it a claim is that it's you know as I said it, it's like an emotive word it's it's some it's a term that you know doesn't help if I'm coming to, if if I'm making up if I'm putting forward a claim that sounds that's a lot it sounds like you know a term like a claim is like is, I think of a claim and I think it's almost something that you that you may not be entitled to I mean whereas I think an application under the contract has has that additional strength behind it that this is a, a ground of entitlement under the contract. So typically claims arise where you're outside of the bounds of the contract. Has been, you know, there's no gen, there's no defined term for a claim either. I just think, and, and my experience has been that you will have more success if you call it a loss and expense application rather than a claim. You can call, but you can call it a claim if you want. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to give advice that, that will help you to maximize the return. And also ideally is what we want out of all of this is that you retain a working relationship as well. My experience has said where you're talking about claims are, is that the relationship can tend to break down and you tend not to work for you not to work together again. You, you know, we're trying to get through loss and expense. It happens. It's not a very comfortable area for people because you know, it's, it, there's very there can be little value out of money paid for loss and expense, but if it's dealt with by loss and expense under the contract, you have a you have a better chance of be of of dealing with it, recovering more money, but also retaining um, a working relationship at some time in the future as well. Okay, um, someone else has asked. Um, they they uh, their internet dropped out right at the uh, the start, but um, are they right in understanding that a subcontractor cannot submit a loss and expense claim against the main contractor for the government implications on the two meter working space to deal with COVID-19 as this is outside the control of the main contractor. Yeah, difficult one. Um, the, so we have, a, yeah, you have a lot of main contractors who are basically insist keeping sites open and they are seeking to uh, you know, have the two meter working and improve, you know, increased hygiene um, in, you know, precautions in place, which, which I get, but the, it, um, I mean, I, I say that it, it depends on, on how it's been communicated, because if it's an instruction that, you know, if it's an instruction that you're still on site, then, you know, main contractors could potentially be at risk for subcontractors saying that as a result of your instruction or what we call a, a relevant matter under impediment prevention or default, then potentially you could have subcontractors uh, bringing forward applications for loss and expense. 
it depends on the communication, Julie. It's, it's been a notoriously battleground for the last couple of weeks and something that's going to continue as more employers are seeking to keep contra- construction sites open and as a result, main contractors seeking to you know, get their, keep their subcontractors um, working uh, on site. But there's no doubt that you know, the, the subcontractor, if he has to adhere to those measures, there will be losses as a result because they're now no longer working in the same manner as they envisage under the contract. It just depends on whether it, it, it qualifies as a relevant event or not. Uh, okay, and I, and I know um, <clears throat> both Henry and John Sharp have spent a lot of time talking about both the insurance and construction aspects, yeah. and construction yeah. contract aspects of COVID. Um, we're also being asked, is there any court case confirmed that the common law right can be excluded from a contract? Um, is, there, is there any case law? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure on, on that one. I can, I can research the points, um, I'm not, but I'm not sure on that one. I mean, I mean where I've had clients or, or where, I've, you know, where I've been defending claims, if I feel that the common law, uh, common law rights have been deleted, then you know generally the, the schedule of amendments should be clear enough. I mean I'd, I'd imagine parties are reluctant to run to run the you know the the core process in order to find that out because it should it ought to be pretty clear whether your common law rights have been deleted or not. So I can research the point and, and pass it on. I mean I'm going to do a list of questions and some feedback and some answers anyway. So I'll 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 try and provide a, a like an that answer within okay. that. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. And Paul's asking another a COVID-19 uh, specific question, yeah. which we may have to direct to John. I don't know. Um, so how do we treat COVID-19 and treat COVID-19 claim when they arise under contract in general? This, uh, this is a claim for loss and expense. Yeah, I'm assuming so. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back to, I mean, whoever the, whoever the applicant is, you know, they need to prove, they need to show that the you know the the instru- like that there has been an instruction or something done that entitles them to the loss and expense under the relevant matter clause. Um, because if they, I mean, if there is, if if they can't satisfy that again, if they, if they can't establish liability, then the claim won't get off the ground. You say. Okay, um, that that joinery loss and expense question earlier uh, posed by Steve. This was this he's saying this was passed on by the main contractor in their loss and expense calculation late in the day. Yeah, you see, you know, <laughs> that's the problem. It's 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 impossible almost to to establish whether it was genuine or not, and the burden of proof has to be on the you know the subcontractor. Um, and, and the joinery business there because you know they ought to be communicating that these people have been working non-productively um, and, and, and they also need to establish liability they, they need to establish like the cause and effect again that's it sounds like they're going for you know a, a global claim where they're you know they're coming in at a late stage far you know several months after the event um, and I, it's it's going to it's it's difficult, uh, you know. That it, it, again, it bears out in the facts and what was being communicated at the time the non-efficient working was going on. Um, all of those points need to be dealt with. But like a ter- like a terrible dilemma to end up in at the end of a contract where you're trying to recover sums for people that were incurred six months ago that weren't even on site. It's it's I mean it, it's it's very difficult and you should not be. I, like the, the advice is that like if you are like that's why I'm saying act quickly don't sit on it and, and give the notice six months after because your chances of recovering the, the sums that you're saying uh, you've lost uh, is, is, is diminished effectively. Okay thanks for that. Um, Paul's asked quite a specific question about COVID, so Paul, I'm actually going to send you some links to some other seminars we've held over the last week, which will probably answer that question quite clearly. Um, other than that, thank you very much everyone for attending. Uh, the recording of these uh, seminars this evening will be put out online. Hopefully they'll be available tomorrow at some point for everybody. Um, and thank you, Connor, for your time and your expertise. Yeah, and, thank, uh, you very, everyone, thank you everyone.
please stay safe everybody and hopefully we'll see you at an online seminar again soon thanks for your time absolutely thanks guys cheers